I believe that by embracing nature in the buildings we live in, we can save the planet. When I turn 100 years old, which is in 2042, what could the world look like? Well, the predictions are that fossil fuel use may increase as much as doubling. And just think what effect that has on carbon dioxide and our climate. Mammal species, species in general, there's an accelerating uh, endangerment and loss of species in its totality. Third one is population. It's predicted that population is going to increase from 7 billion to 9 billion, 30 percent. With many of those people living in cities, it's predicted that 80 percent will be in urban populations. And it says forestation, but it's deforestation. So far, humans have been responsible for a loss of 50 percent of our forest, there is potentially another 30% that's going to be lost because of the population and third world wanting to become second and first world w with all these issues. And of course, this is the classic, the, the warming of the Arctic. But the, the really serious part of this is what's called a mass extinction of species. And there are predictions right now that uh, within the next several centuries, we could be experiencing the sixth mass extinction on Earth. And that's in the last 500 million years. The last one was the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But it is that serious a problem ahead. And obviously, humans are part of, we're species. <laughs> so uh, we're definitely a risk. As a matter of fact, for fun, I uh, did some simulations on Sim Earth, a computer model of the world, to see what happened if humans disappeared. And guess what? Very intelligent lizards took over. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I suspect is NASA is not only looking for habitable planets for just scientific purposes, but perhaps you can think what the possibilities are there. Okay, now I'm going to take you back, way back to 1948, suburb in Toledo, Ohio. And there's me as a six-year-old. My dad was an air traffic controller, so you can see the little airplane. He posted. <clears throat> well, a couple things that, that I recall. One is in the summertime, he'd love to use DDT to kill the mosquitoes. And I'd be there spraying, he'd hold the can, and I was covered with DDT. <laughs> but it smelled good. <laughs> ah, DDT. <laughs> Let's see, yeah, there's the DDT. And in the wintertime, my job was to shovel coal into our furnace. Three shovelfuls every morning, and I got covered with coal dust. Oh, that sweet smell of coal dust. <laughs> And of course, back then, my dad didn't know how could we know the tremendous potential devastating effects of what life was back then and what was ahead. Well, not necessarily through these experiences, but uh, I went ahead and got a, uh, a degree in chemical engineering, and that was a mistake. <laughs> Failure number one. I won't go into details. <laughs> So, I'm smart, why don't I go to law school? Well, that didn't work out either. So, this is now mid-1960s. Uh, people of my age had the opportunity to drop out, so I did. I, I joined a commune uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And one of my jobs was, oh, there's coal, gardening. Uh, the commune was called the Association for the Understanding of Man, and I'm digging around the dirt. And all of a sudden, I realized, this wasn't really all of a sudden, but I realized that that is what's sustaining us. That dirt, that top six inches of topsoil. And that's a career. That's a career opportunity. How can I protect, protect that soil? And so, that catapulted me into, what do I need to do? I went back to school. I got several advanced degrees. 
in environmental engineering and started as assistant professor at the University of Houston in 1974. And so for the next decade, I ta actually taught global warming and other subjects to uh, engineering students. But there was something missing. I taught it from my head. I taught it intellectually. It was still not coming from the heart. But then an event happened that changed all that. I was out playing tennis at Rice University, which was my alma mater. And I was walking up to serve, and all of a sudden, blacked out. I was hit by, oh, there I am. You can see how sunburned I was back <laughs> I have to go see the doctor to cut off my melanoma every six months to uh, do that exposure. But anyways, I got hit by a shard of lightning and brain scrambled, quickly went into therapy, post-traumatic stress, and uh, my therapist, trying to reconstruct my life, asked me a question. He said, tell me about your creativity. I looked at him, what? I'm an engineer. <laughs> I hear some clapping there. <laughs> uh, uh. But as we got into the conversation, well, Jack, how'd you learn how to ride a bicycle? How did you do this? How did you do that? Well, you know, we are all creative. And that I had been really uh, underutilizing uh, my creative potential. And so, because this was a lifeline for me, I just grabbed it, and all I wanted to do was be creative. Trouble is, I didn't know anything about it. Didn't know how to do it, but I'm an academic. <laughs> Let's read about it. Let's study it. Let's experiment. Students in my classes, engineering classes, what are you doing to me? Why, why are you trying to make me creative? Uh, but I persisted, because to me it was, it was almost life and death in terms of doing it. And after several years, what I had been doing started to make sense. And the making sense was that those failures were essential, essential for knowledge acquisition, my knowledge of how to teach creativity, and that failure was the key to being creative. And I became an expert in failure. Now, uh, you see my book here, Innovate or Die. Well, there's a little story associated with it. Uh, I, I wrote a manuscript, and I titled it Failure 101, How to Become a Successful Failure. I sent it to 30 publishers. And there was a unanimous response, no. <laughs> And what was the no? Well, some of them said, books with failure in the title just don't sell. Oh, fast failure. Let's retitle it. <laughs> and that started selling quite well. Uh, so anyways, uh, a couple things about failure that I think uh, are significant, and I'm going to get to the topic of eco buildings in a minute, is that a concept of slow, stupid failure, which is the way most of us do things. Well, you do it sequentially and slowly, and, you're, and so the, the acquisition of knowledge is quite slow and can be quite stupid, because who wants a good failure resume? It's not something we really aspire to, but it's important. Matter of fact, I have students in my classes actually construct a failure resume to show that failures uh, help them understand themselves. But anyways, uh, I put this up there because if we, you look at the way we're going trending in the world in terms of saving the planet, we're in a slow, stupid failure mode right now. We're destroying our natural resources. We're digging deeper in the oceans for exp doing the Arctic. We're trashing the environment in Pennsylvania with uh, uh, shale gas. So there's a lot of slow, stupid failure going, going on as opposed to intelligent fast failure. You have to be creative and find solutions to difficult problems. We need to experiment a lot, and we need to learn a lot from those experiments. And so 
that is really the key to creativity, to innovation, and ultimately the key to solving uh, the issues, the incredible issues we have uh, with our planet. So, let me take you to the main subject, which is, since the title of this is Relics to Revolution, I actually have some slides on that. Relics being, how did humans, what did they live in originally? Well, we started out as primates, we were living in trees, as we developed bipedalism, uh, we started living in caves, in holes in the ground. And so here's various versions of using natural materials, you could call these the first eco-dwellings. Uh, let's see. I thought I'd throw in a cartoon here. Uh, the cartoon represents, uh, in moving from holes to huts, about 10,000 years ago, we were started to actually design dwellings due to the agricultural uh, revolution. That's when things really changed. And that's when uh, uh, religions came into existence. And in some religions, it was kind of against nature. How do we keep the bad effects of nature out in our designs? Well, we have current relics. Uh, current in that they're not energy efficient. Uh, they're not embracing nature, uh, and, and so they're problematic. We have a huge housing stock of over 100, 100 million homes that uh, are, are not eco very much. Well, uh, my wife Elizabeth Gorm and I moved up here in the early 90s. I had to head up an innovation center. Living close to the university, there were rundown student houses that were for sale. We decided to purchase those and <clears throat> renovate them as uh, equal <coughs> eco-rentals. And Elizabeth developed a green lease, and so we had uh, people who wanted to live that lifestyle and live it, pas live it passionately uh, in our homes. And then I had the opportunity in early 2000 to acquire a vacant piece of land near downtown for those of you in State College, it's Locust, Eddie's Foster. And the opportunity to really design from the grassroots an eco uh, building that embraces nature. And that the human nature interface was key to doing this. So this was an artist's depiction in the beginning of what it looked like, and this is what it is today. You can barely see the building because it's so surrounded with vegetation and trees. If you look closely, there are solar panels on top. It's very energy efficient. And essentially, all the materials in the building came from local sources. This is from the balcony. Again, you look like you're in a forest, but actually the building's right behind Beaver Canyon. This is the exterior. The uh, wood here is hemlock, which is abundant here in the state of Pennsylvania. This is our conference room. So again, you, you have that feeling, that natural feeling. Uh, and here's uh, some workstations. So if you're tired of the computer screen, you just look up and you, you get that uh, eco feeling. Because the building was so uh, wonderful in, in those terms, we decided to start up a company called Invinity uh, to build eco buildings and alternative energy and so forth. So. Uh, we had clients who wanted to embrace nature in their homes, and here's some uh, photographs of those. This is uh, a living room, timber frame living room, and you can see it's winter time, but you get that feeling with that wood, trees inside. And here's some bathrooms. You can see how we left kind of the wildness of nature in there because we have that, that wildness in our souls. And here's another example of bathroom scene. And then uh, a, a kitchen and, and dining area. So both the inside and outside embracing nature and getting that feeling that goes back to not only as homo hobbless homo sapien, but even further back than that, our genetic heritage. Uh, another one. Okay, that takes you to today. There's still a piece missing from my equation. And that piece missing is 
I'll use the term uh, dematerialization, because we are running out of resources. We have to quit uh, wanting everything, wanting things. Of course, we need enough material to satisfy our needs, but in our society, based on uh, the, the way the culture has developed, we're greedy, we, we get stuff, we buy stuff. And I was looking for a country where it was the opposite, a country that did not have uh, natural resources, we had a poor climate. And that country is Bhutan, which is sandwiched between India and China, a small country, 700,000 people up in the Himalayas. It's a Buddhist country. You can see how they, they built that temple right inside the mountain. And uh, they have a most interesting attitude in that country. It's not based on gross national product. They don't even look at that. As a matter of fact, they're, if you looked at it that way, it's, a, it's less than one-tenth of the United States. Uh, their goal is gross national happiness. Uh, looking inside, looking spiritually, embracing an eco-consciousness. They've devoted 66% of their land to being a reserve for the forest. And there is Elizabeth and I in the native costume. We're preparing to go to Bhutan next year, so we walk around the house. No, not really, but <laughs> uh, we've had several visiting scholars from Bhutan, and we've learned a lot about the country, and we're, we're very eager to uh, visit it. And that brings us also to today. A, a fairly amazing thing happened this last week. On the ballot in State College was a referendum called Environmental Bill of Rights. And it turned out to be quite controversial in terms of should you give rights to the ecosystem comparable to the rights of humans. As a matter of fact, uh, clean air, water, uncontaminated land, shouldn't that be integrated in whatever uh, the borough does? Uh, would it pass? Is that too radical? Well, it turned out that 75% of those who voted, voted yes. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, there is an eco-consciousness. There is opportunity. So lastly, I'm going to leave you, this is a tree in our backyard. It's a very special tree. It's a weeping uh, cherry and how it's uh, rooted in our soil. And there's my ugly legs, <laughs> rooted in that same soil. And that's what we need to understand and appreciate and embrace nature. Thank you.